From the Missouri School of Journalism, welcome to Global Journalist. I'm Jim Flink. You're probably well aware that every country has a parliament or a legislature of some sort. But did you know that Europe as a whole also has its own parliament? The European Parliament is part of the European Union, and next week, people in EU member states will go to the polls to elect their representatives. Today, we're going to preview the upcoming elections, as well as talk about the potential rise of more far-right parties making a name on the European stage. But first, to tell us a bit more about the European Parliament and what it does, we're joined today by Global Journalist Executive Producer Casey Morell, who visited Parliament last spring, has done some research on the European Union as well. And Casey, thanks for joining us. Thank so you, let's talk a a little bit about what the European Parliament does. Sure. So the European Parliament is based both in Strasbourg, France, and in Brussels, Belgium. Brussels being the main city that people associate with the European Union because that's where most of the offices are. It's the only directly elected part of the European Union. So it's the only opportunity for people in member states to basically choose who they want to represent themselves. So each country has a certain number of delegates to the European Parliament, and it's based on their population. The more populous countries get more seats. It's basically like the U.S. House of Representatives. So Germany, for instance, being the biggest country in the European Union, has the most seats. They currently have 99. Cyprus, Estonia, Luxembourg, Malta, the smaller countries, they're guaranteed a minimum of six. That's what they have. So let's talk a little bit about the rise of the far right and, and maybe what the roots of that are. Sure. So one of the things that the European Parliament gets to do is craft a budget. They are the ones who are in charge of figuring out where the EU's money is going to go. There have been a lot of controversies lately due to the economic crisis about countries in southern Europe, Greece, Italy, those that have suffered primarily from this recession, receiving a lot more funding from the northern, more wealthy countries like Germany you're starting to see a lot more Euroscepticism in northern countries because they don't necessarily want to spend the money to bail out these southern countries. At least that's how they see it. You also see some instances of xenophobia in other parts of Europe where attitudes towards people in Eastern Europe still aren't very favorable. So we're starting to see more people not necessarily being openly as antagonistic about the EU wanting to get rid of it, but maybe saying, hey, let's slow down a bit. Let's figure out what we actually want this body to do before we take it any further. And yet it continues to gain in power. And this is a clean sweep. All 751 mm -hmm. seats are up for election. So yeah. whatever happens in this election can be pivotal. Exactly. So how it works is uh, some of the countries are actually going to be losing seats due to the accession of Croatia. Croatia. Croatia just joined the European Union a couple of months ago. Some countries are going to be losing seats because the EU has capped the seats that are in the parliament to 751. Germany is going to lose a couple of seats. Uh, Ireland is going to lose a few. Uh, Croatia is also going to be losing one. But basically, as you said, all of the seats are up for grabs. So we could see a real shift in the balance of power. Currently, if we take a look at the seats that are in Parliament right now, um, the primary chunk of them are held by the European People's Party, which is a somewhat center-right party. If you're at all familiar with the governing party in Germany, the Christian Democratic Union, it's that type of governance. Uh, the other biggest chunk is the group of socialists and Democrats. Those are your more left-leaning parties, your groups like Labour in England, for instance. What we might see is the EPP losing some of its strength, uh, the socialists and Democrats gaining a little bit, but more gains in some of the more right-wing groups, the Europe for Freedom and Democracy group, for instance, which has a lot more Eurosceptic parties in it that basically sit there and try to obstruct whatever parliament does. And despite that, that type of a group, the mm -hmm. obstructionists and the skeptics, really the decisions really rest somewhere in the middle, which, which can be perceived as the strength of this kind of a system. Exactly. One of the big things that the EU is built on is a system of compromise when you think about it because Parliament itself can't craft legislation. All the legislation has to come from the European Commission, which is basically a group of technocrats who sit there and do nothing but craft legislation. Parliament has to approve it and basically the Commission and the Parliament work together to come up with the best possible solution for the best number of people. That said, uh, with, with Parliament growing in power, this year they get to do something they haven't done uh, here to four, which is to elect its own leadership, yes? Exactly. So what's going to happen now is the uh, parliament is going to be able to elect a somewhat presidential figure that's going to be the head of the commission. And that's basically going to probably be a consensus candidate amongst the larger groups in parliament. 
you will probably see the EPP and the Socialists and Democrats working together to elect somebody that they both find amenable because they won't want someone possibly from the more far right or far left leaning groups to take charge. So while the far right may be getting a lot of the headlines in, in reality, uh, power remains in the center. I think it's really going to be business as usual once the elections take place. It's still going to be a similar balance of power to what we see now, just the colors of the seats might be a little bit different. Global Journalist Executive Producer Casey Morell, thanks for the context. Appreciate it. Anytime. Joining us now on Global Journalist is Gareth Harding. He's a Brussels-based journalist who heads the University of Missouri's Brussels program. And Derek Beach is an associate professor of political science and government at Aarhus University in Aarhus, Denmark, who studies the European Union. And thank you both for joining us today on Global Journalist. Thank you. Gareth, let's start with you. Uh, at a time when uh, the European Union Parliament seems to be gaining so much power, there seems to be sort of a, a lack of interest in the public, the, uh, smaller and smaller turnouts at these elections, yes? This is the central paradox of the Parliament, really, is that since 1979, when first direct elections were held to the European Parliament, uh, voter turnout has been going down at every single election. So every five years that people are asked to vote, they vote less and less. So down from around two thirds in 1979 to around 42% at the last elections in 2009. At the same time, Parliament's powers have been increasing step by step since then. So that every treaty change, which is basically like constitutional change in the European Union, Parliament is the winner. So it's a central paradox of the system really that uh, you're having greater powers for a European Parliament, but less and less interest. And in particular, this election has higher stakes yet because the, uh, the Parliament has a say now in who, who the leadership is, a greater say, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, according to the Lisbon Treaty, our latest uh, constitution light, if you want, uh, the, the Parliament uh, has been asked to consider who should be the next uh, European Commission president. So the European Commission is like the European Union's executive body. And uh, EU leaders usually pick the European Commission president a bit like uh, cardinals pick the Pope. Mm -hmm. uh, it's basically, they go behind closed doors, up comes the white smoke, and a new EU leader is announced. Well, this time, according to the treaty, and for the first time, uh, they're supposed to take into account uh, EU leaders are supposed to take into account the results of the European Parliament elections. So Parliament have, have kind of gone on a, a power grab and, and basically preempted this process by saying, well, we're going to propose candidates uh, for this post. They're going to run during this elections. And if we emerge as the biggest group, uh, then we are entitled to have our guy uh, as European Commission president. So in a way, you're seeing the first... Uh, European, perhaps the first ever international presidential election campaign. Uh, and it's been quite an experience. Casey Morell referenced earlier the, the rise of the right and just sort of the breakdown of the parliament. To what do you attribute the rise of the right? I, I understand that there's a, certainly a lot of economic underpinnings to all of it. You want me to take that one or Derek want to come uh, in? Well, uh, for your perspective first, and then I want to, yeah. I want to check in with Derek. Yeah. Sure. Uh, obviously, the rise of the populist right, and it's not just the right, you're also seeing a rise of a kind of populist far left as well, expected to gain somewhere between 20-25% of the overall vote. So there will be a more Eurosceptic or larger Eurosceptic uh, populist uh, anti-EU or EU sceptical group in the European Parliament uh, as of next month. Uh, obviously, it's linked in part to uh, the euro crisis and the severe economic uh, depression which Europe has been experiencing for five years and to a certain extent is still in the middle of. Uh, America's almost out of it, unemployment's down, growth is up. Uh, in Europe we still got much higher unemployment uh, than you guys and uh, slug a more sluggish growth and a lot of people, millions of people have been very very hard hit. And I think quite rightly to a certain extent, uh, they're blaming Europe because there is a connection between this crisis and the euro. And so uh, the anger is, is raw. I think it's understandable. And obviously uh, 
governing coalitions in the, Euro the European Union are uh, easy scapegoats. And Derek Beach, let's talk a little bit about that because there are some American correlations between particularly uh, sectors of the European population like Germany that are supporting some of the other uh, more troubled economies uh, such as, for, for instance, Greece. You, you draw some correlations between what's happened recently in American politics. Well, yeah, I think I think in some in some respects you can you can compare this this these movements uh, with the Tea Party, uh, kind of a, a, a disparate group of 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 opposition voices, protest voices that has uh, arisen you know in the United States after the financial crisis, and the feeling that the kind of the whole establishment didn't really, uh, you know, was was the problem, uh, and and you're seeing a similar in in Europe, especially with this thing, you know the Euro crisis. Is that a rise of, of, of different you know, factions uh, who, are, who have this this kind of opposition or protest against the establishment? Uh, so you have, for example, in Germany, um, Eurosceptic uh, groups uh, have have kind of exploded. Um, they're probably not going to get a huge amount of votes, but 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 still, it's it's un, unheard of before in Germany. Uh, and and this is a lot of a lot of it is. Simply this opposition to um, the euro crisis, and especially, for example, in Germany, the role that Germany uh, is going to be seeing, uh, the voters are seeing uh, Germany uh, ending up in as far as pos possibly paying a lot of money uh, to the southern European countries, and, and, and so these groups are opposing that. You're listening to Global Journalist. I'm Jim Flink. Today we're talking about the European Parliament elections taking place next week and their potential impact on world affairs. Our guests are Gareth Harding, who now heads the University of Missouri's Brussels program, and Derek Beach, who is an associate professor of political science and government at Aarhus University in Aarhus, Denmark. Derek, picking up on that just a little bit further, uh, the Euroscepticism, you know, m many around the world perhaps don't even understand the role uh, that the EU Parliament plays. Some have referenced it as a, a, a Mickey Mouse outfit of some sort. And yet, uh, the expanding role, it should be taken quite seriously, should it not? Well, yeah. I mean, it, in, in most important uh, policy areas uh, that Europe deals with, uh, the Parliament is, a, is the second chamber. I mean, for Americans, it's actually quite easy to understand uh, what, what Europe's about. Uh, or the European Union is about. It's all about interstate commerce, which is like the federal government in the United States. It's just a kind of federal government light. Um, so, so when we talk about Brussels, you could just say D.C. And the powers that the, the Europe has, the European Union has, are in many respects quite analogous to what you find in the United States with, you know, again, regulating interstate commerce just a little bit more restrictive than the United States. And, of course, we don't have foreign policy and that stuff. So when you compare, then, uh, Washington, D.C., and Brussels in, in the United States, at the federal level, we have Congress with, with uh, two chambers, the House of Representatives and Senate, that both have to agree on, on a, a proposal before it can become you know, a bill, before it can become law. And it's really the same kind of thing you have in Europe. You have the, the European Senate, which is the Council of Ministers, uh, and then you have the European House of Representatives, which is the European Parliament. Uh, and so the elections now are about electing one of the chambers, which is directly elected, the House of, uh, the European House of Representatives or the European Parliament. The this this sort of um, split in in the makeup of the EU Parliament is is interesting, and I'm I'm curious to know, Derek, whether um, you see a particular group holding sway at this point. When when you see the Eurosceptics um, and then the more liberal sort of uh, elements, who do you think holds sway in these next elections? Well, that comparing the United States and and, and Europe, I mean, that's the huge difference, for example, between a Tea Party and a two party system in Congress. And Europe, uh, in, in in the European Union Parliament, uh, we have many parties, and um, we have especially, I would say, three central parties: two big ones, a, a kind of a right, a little bit to the right of the middle, of the Conservatives, the EPP as they're called, and then the Socialists, which are a little bit left of the middle, and then we have a liberal group in between. And so these three, these two big groups, and the liberal group in between, kind of either all go together or they. They form smaller coalitions where they get a majority. Which this means is that, is that, is that uh, majorities are always in the middle. So when we have these, these, these opposition groups, 
rising on both the left and the right, but they're quite far out either on the left or the right. They're far outside of influence. So in comparison to the United States, where the Tea Party in the House can actually have quite a lot of uh, influence within the, within the Republicans, because the Republicans have the majority and they're part of the Republican Party, uh, in, in Europe... Uh, when these opposition groups um, maybe get 20% of the votes, they're going to be marginalized, and all of the majorities that are going to be enacting bills are in the middle, and they're always going to be excluding the Eurosceptics. So, so in that aspect, um, there's a lot of voters whose voice is, is simply not going to be heard by the European Parliament. And Gareth Harding, is that part of what may be driving a, a, a little bit of apathy in terms of like driving significant change? Yes, I think it does contribute to the apathy because people don't really think that their voice is heard. No matter who you vote for, you know that the two biggest groups, uh, as Derek said, the EPP and the socialists, essentially the centre-left and the centre-right, are going to have about 60% of the overall seats. They're going to carve up the big jobs between them, as they've always done. And they're going to vote together in the vast majority of times. So recent research uh, done by VoteWatch has shown that 75% uh, of the time, the center-right and the center-left actually vote together. So you can understand why people think, well, what's the point in voting? Because whoever I vote for, nothing's going to change much anyway. And if you vote for one of these more populist parties to uh, show your displeasure at the way that the EU is going, which is totally legitimate, again, you're going to feel ex or be excluded in Brussels because the mainstream parties have basically gone to gang up uh, and ignore you. So I think this likely to lead to uh, even greater disillusionment. I'm not sure apathy, though. I actually predict, I'll stick my neck out <laughs> and say that uh, we're probably going to see a slight increase in the vote this time, uh, partly because of the crisis and the amount that Europe has been in the news, perhaps for all the wrong reasons. Uh, and also uh, partly due to this European Commission presidential campaign and partly, I think, because in general, uh, uh, more populist, uh, more extremist voters tend to go to the ballot box more than mainstream ones. You're listening to Global Journalist. Do want to remind you that you can listen to this and other full episodes of Global Journalist on our website. That is globaljournalist.org. For more Global Journalist content, you can also like us on Facebook or you can follow us on Twitter at Global Journ. To the issue of influence, Gareth Harding, uh, one of the things that, that seems to be emerging is more and more lobbyists. As the stake get higher, stakes get higher, more and more folks are trying to influence the outcomes of some of these votes. Can you explain a little bit more about that? What we've seen uh, in, over the last 20 years that I've been living in Brussels, uh, an explosion in the number of lobbyists. But that's just simply because the European Union has become more important uh, on the global stage and in people's everyday lives. So, uh, you know, whether it's the, the what you drink or the, the chemicals in the, in the toys or the products you make, uh, the European Union is likely to have an influence on that. And so obviously uh, non-governmental groups and industry uh, are going to pay big bucks to try and get their voice here through these lobbies. So Brussels now has a uh, pretty large and sophisticated uh, lobbying machine. It's kind of own version of K Street, <laughs> if you want. Some estimate the numbers to be between 10 and 30,000, depending on how you define lobbyists. Uh, and, uh, and a pretty enormous uh, press corps, probably the third biggest international press corps in the world. So uh, as I... Uh, argued in a piece for Politico recently, you could say that Brussels is becoming something like the DC uh, of Europe. Nonetheless, some of these Eurosceptics have nothing greater on their agenda than to be obstructionist. I, I read the story of one Irish lawmaker, for instance, who said that you know he's he's there basically to slow up any progress that's made within the EU. And there are some believe that this Euroscepticism uh, will usher more of those kinds of folks into the Parliament that really are there to tie its hands. How how. Um, Substantial is that movement, and does it gain any traction? Well, the movement is substantial. I mean, UKIP, the UK Independence Party, who could well emerge as uh, the biggest party in the European Parliament from Britain, 
uh, next week's elections. They're garnering between 20 and 25 percent of the vote, uh, easily beating the ruling Conservative Party and even the Labour Party, who are the next pretenders to beat the Tories next year. So uh, a party whose avowed aim is to withdraw Britain from the United Kingdom uh, sends MEPs who get paid hefty allowances to Brussels and Strasbourg to basically undermine the system from inside, kind of uh, peaceful Guy Fawkes, if you want. Right. And um, they, uh, they have an obstructionist agenda, no doubt about it. But they also represent a considerable body of, of opinion within the United Kingdom, and I would say within Europe, that European integration has gone too far, too fast. Uh, the borders have been opened with destruction of, of jobs and uh, social and working conditions. So it's very easy to dismiss uh, these Eurosceptics as naysayers and obstructionists. But I think it'd be extremely dangerous uh, to dismiss the, the ideas uh, or the groundswell of uh, uh, support they have from the general public. Derek Beach, I think we on this side of the, the pond, as it were, you know, kind of look at this whole uh, coalition of countries and you see the, the varying economies and we kind of scratch our heads and think, how does it even work that a country like Greece that, that has its kind of economic and social underpinnings can even work co cooperatively with a country like Germany that has a very different approach to how it does business on a day-to-day -day basis? Well, it's no different than any other, any other federal system where you know the core, the core uh, of, of the federal state is is to you know regulate interstate commerce. You know, so for example, in the United States, there's a huge difference between California's economy and Alabama. There's a huge difference in in uh, then also the the actual you know the economy in these in these states. And there's a huge difference in, I would say, kind of the, the, the type of welfare state. I mean, you have a, a state like California that actually does offer quite a lot of public goods. You know, it has a European welfare state, but something approaching it, whereas some of the southern states especially really have, have a very, very low safety net. Uh, you know, so, so in the United States, it functions. Uh, it functions quite well. Um, you know, it, the, 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 the state, uh, federal state. Uh, and this is really kind of the core of, of what Europe is. And but but what the what the core debate is right now in Europe is kind of well, okay, now we have a common currency. Mm -hmm. That means that we probably are going to have to maybe move Europe to being more like the United States, moving more power to the federal level. I mean, things things that we saw in the United States, perhaps especially in New, during the New Deal in the '30s, with the federalization, centralization of powers from going from state to the federal level, you're seeing those debates happening now in Europe, which is also giving rise to this Euroscepticism, where a lot of voters, especially in countries like Germany, are saying, no, I don't want to live in a federal state where a lot of my tax dollars are going to be going to pay uh, for, for Greek uh, people, for example. And, and nowhere was that discussion more heated than in the throes of the financial crisis, which, uh, as you, you know, one of you correctly noted, uh, Europe has been a little, little bit slower to emerge from than has the United States. Is that, Derek Beach, in part because of the, the complexity of, of this system and, and, and how to recover and the very varying points of view on that? Well, I mean, I... I think I think that people like Paul Krugman have actually been, you know, American-based uh, based economics have actually had the best analysis of the euro crisis, where they're basically saying is that is that Europe decided to do a project that was 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 not complete uh, as far as you, you have a common currency, then you need to also have a common some form of common fiscal policy, uh, we call fiscal federalism. Uh, where you you move resources from where it's going good to where it's going bad to help out the the the, country, the 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 states that are doing poorly and you have this in the United States you have fiscal transfers we know that for example a state like Massachusetts pays in more to the federal government uh, over a 20 year period than it gets out whereas states like West Virginia pull out a lot um, and and so so Europe kind of moved into this um, into this, the the euro crisis. And we had these problems in the peripheral countries, but you didn't have any of the transfer of resources like you have 
available in the United States to help out these countries. So the crisis in countries like Spain and Italy has been far worse than it would have been if we had a, I would say, a properly functioning federal system. Gareth Harding, your take on that, because I know there was a, a lot of discussion about taking some of the, uh, you know, the, the, the taker countries, if you were, and kind of booting them out of the EU, EU at one point. Yeah, well, the, the strange thing is, is that the logic uh, of the euro points to an ever closer union and points, as Derek said, to fiscal union and fiscal transfers and economic governance, much more like the United States, the so United States of Europe. The problem is is that there doesn't seem to be much support for going down that route amongst the European publics, uh, let alone the governments. So it's one thing to say, we want a common currency and we want a European government, but it's another to take so-called orders from Brussels uh, to say, slash your budgets on health or pensions or education, the precise policies in which you've been elected by your national electors uh, so that's the difficulties. If you go ahead towards a greater uh, European Union and European integration, the kind of United States of Europe, it kind of makes more sense in terms of saving the euro. Uh, but I think at the expense of perhaps shattering the whole project because the people are simply do not back that. And with about 30 seconds a piece left, uh, what is the result of this election short and long term and, and, and very briefly? Gareth? Oh, I think you're going to see a very slight uh, rise in turnout. I think the centre-right should just about hold on to their uh, lead in the European Parliament, but with a massive uh, boost for the Eurosceptic uh, groups in the Parliament. So a slightly more disparate Parliament, uh, unruly Parliament in the future. And will, you, will there be any economic results as a result of this election? Will there be any changes, policy changes? I don't see any direct, immediate ones. It could become a little bit more protectionist. Right. Uh, parliament, as you've got both from the, the far right and the far left tend to be a little bit more protectionist, a little bit more, you know, closing up and shutting down the borders rather than opening them up in, in the past. So not great news, I think, for the uh, uh, EU diehards. Derek Beach, your thoughts? Well, I think, I think uh, on a positive note to end the program, um, what, what we're actually debating this time in these elections is Europe. Is actually the, 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 the greatest paradox of these of, of a European Parliament elections is it's typically national politics that people are discussing. So you only have these national elections. So in Denmark, for example, they only talk about Danish uh, politics, and you know, uh, and this is the first time I'm really seeing uh, people actually discussing Europe and you know what, what where should Europe go? Uh, and of course, it's it, the Eurosceptics are are maybe benefiting for that from that discussion, but. It's at least they're 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 taking uh, they're actually voting on the issue that they're being asked to to, to vote on uh, yeah. here in a couple of weeks. That'll have to be the final word. That's all for this edition of Global Journalist, a production of the Reynolds Journalism Institute and the Missouri School of Journalism. Our thanks to our guests Gareth Harding and Derek Beach. Our executive producer is Casey Morell. Our lead producer, Michael Christensen, and with assistance from Alex Drosler. Travis McMillan from the Reynolds Journalism Institute is our technical director. Pat Akers from KBIA, our audio engineer. Join us again next time for another edition of Global Journalist. I'm Jim Fling. Thanks for listening.